Hi, everybody. My name's Clay. I'm a developer advocate at New Relic. New Relic is a software analytics company. Our Portland engineering offices are a little bit less than three blocks away. And today, I'm going to be talking to you about creating a user space file system in Node.js. And a uh, couple, couple things about the title. Uh, there are two things. I mean, as, as the computer science quote goes, there are two hard problems in computer science. Uh, caching and naming things, I'd say it applies to talks. Uh, naming talks and talking about caching. Uh, Front-end FS is uh, really talking about the, the goal of this talk, and that's an introduction to creating user space file systems using the open source Fuse library uh, with an eye to kind of automating some simple front-end tasks. It's not uh, you know, writing a file system using SAS or you know, CSS DOM query selectors or anything like that, although that would be kind of an interesting uh, talk. And part of the reason I'm talking about file systems and why I think it's important is it's this classic kind of systems programming concept that's very difficult. Kind of writing a new file system that ships in the Linux kernel is kind of PhD dissertation level. Uh, the really nice thing about Fuse, and Fuse has been around a while since 2002, is it makes it easy for people that maybe come from a front end or application back, an application development background to kind of spin up their own virtual file system. And I think that's really important for two reasons. Uh, particularly for front ends, the build systems and the tooling we're creating on the front end continues to get more and more complicated. Uh, I'm sure I'm not the only person who's seen the 1800 line grunt file or gulp file. And so I think there's some benefits to kind of abstracting that and moving into the file system layer using a user space file system. And the second thing is as we all migrate to the cloud, we're doing more and more IO with file-like things in, in these uh, cloud vendors. And all of these vendors have their own REST, JSON, XML APIs for interacting with those files. But what we really want to do is use our existing tools, our existing shell scripts to interact with those files. So by wrapping those APIs in a user space file system, we're able to basically mount those APIs on our local, uh, on our local computers and use existing tools. So I think those are the two selling points of kind of writing your own user space file systems using Fuse and kind of what the, uh, the benefit is uh, to developers nowadays. Um, to get the definition of file systems out of the way as quickly as possible, simple English Wikipedia to the rescue. This should be pretty, pretty familiar. Uh, file system, I prefer the, the one word style, is a way of storing all data on a data storage device. If you've used a computer, a desktop computer in the last 30 years, you're very familiar with files and directories, files inside of directories. And the really nice thing about that is that regardless of your skill level, regardless if you're a uh, software engineer or developer or not, uh, people know and understand files and directories. So kind of hacking, getting into that layer and messing around with it uh, is a really nice interface to present to all sorts of different users, which is why I was particularly interested with it in the front end space, kind of the ability to tell someone, hey, uh, to send this to production or to gzip it or to fingerprint it, just drop it in a directory and automatically it'll be good to go. To speak really briefly about kind of Unix E uh, file system architecture, this is based on the Fuse documentation. Uh, two points here. One is the virtual file system in Unix. So Unix, think, and this is a really nice thing, uh, it supports multiple file systems in the, same, uh, in the same tree. So that means, you know, maybe five years ago you had a CD-ROM drive, you can mount it, you can CD into it, the exact same you would uh, is a directory that's maybe mounted on a remote network share. It doesn't really matter, the underlying file system, the commands, the interface for interacting with the files uh, is pretty much agnostic of where those bits are actually stored, which is really nice. Infuse fits very well into this existing architecture uh, using some really clever hacks. And this is what I really like about Fuse. So there's a kernel module part of Fuse, and that's really useful because then you can write another process that's a client to that kernel module that receives all of the commands that are going on in the kernel, and you can then provide all of the metadata and the files that, uh, that, that the operating system expects when you're doing I.O. on these mounted file systems. And the acronym FUSE uh, stands for File Systems and User Space, and it has a long history since, I think I said before, around 2002, of kind of providing an abstraction around file-like things, typically over a network. Uh, 
And it uh, does that through this kind of clever uh, request and response model. So let's say you have another process. It could be uh, you know, uh, CP, LS, you know, you're, you're looking at the contents of a directory. It goes down to the kernel. It hits the fuse kernel module. It requests all of the directory contents. That then gets up, back up to the fuse client. The fuse client gets that command, says, OK, we're requesting the contents of this directory. And I'm going to provide you the contents, the metadata associated with that directory uh, in application code that's running in user space. The um, n one note I want to make about user space in the kernel, this, this dotted white line here, is that Unix E operating systems do have, uh, I, I like to think of it as sandboxing. It's that any given normal user process does not have completely unrestricted access to all of the system resources. And the, one of the major motivations behind that is you don't want any process to read and write arbitrary memory and then take down the entire system. Not that you can't write code that does that, but there are some basic security guarantees. And one of the benefits and selling points of Fuse is that the file system itself is running in user space. So if your Fuse file system has bugs, which as you're developing these in programming languages, inevitably you'll, uh, you'll crash the file system, it's pretty easy to force unmount it, and you're good to go. Um, and for purposes of this talk, we're focusing on Fuse being written in Node.js, of course. And the really wonderful thing about writing a Fuse client in Node.js is Node, as we all know, is very, very good at async I.O. So file operations grabbing file metadata, and then there's a callback. It's a very, very familiar pattern. If you've ever done the simple Node HTTP server, uh, this is very approachable, which is great. Uh, so now let's talk about kind of the basics of how to write a, a, a virtual file system here in Node. Um, all images uh, in this uh, talk, by the way, are uh, Flickr searches sorted by most interesting with the keywords of the title. So there are some interesting ones to come. But ultimately, there's a GitHub project called Fuse Bindings. There's another one called Fuse for JS. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to get it to work. Fuse bindings, I was, but uh, you use this NPM module, you implement the required file system operations, you then mount it to an existing directory, the directory has to exist, so you node, you run your code, it mounts this Fuse file system described in your, uh, your JavaScript to that directory, uh, you tell it how to provide the metadata, and then any IO on that directory on the mounted file system passes through that node process. A uh, couple key, um, a couple key methods that Fuse Bindings expects, and these uh, map one-to-one -to, -one to the libfuse um, C library. Read and write, of course. You need to get data in and out of specific files, and um, it's uh, buffer-based, so these are Node.js buffers, read and write buffers. Uh, we then have create to create the file, open, same thing. Uh, read directory provides a list of files. The documentation is a little bit shaky. Uh, there's a great link, and these slides will be shared after, that um, describes all of the C methods, which map uh, exactly to fuse bindings, more or less. I uh, want to take a brief aside on uh, git adder there. That's getting the uh, metadata for a specific file. So uh, the size, of course, uh, who owns it, when it was created, when it was last modified, the, um, the very critical metadata that belongs to every file on a Unix system, and that gets called a lot. So it's pretty interesting uh, when you're getting started and you're like, okay, I'm gonna just console log all of these, uh, all of these calls as I'm interacting with uh, this directory in the shell. This is me copying a uh, cat.jpg file into my mounted fuge file system. But uh, you can actually see what the copy command is doing. So it's getting the attributes for the root directory of the mounted file system, getting it for cat.jpg, which doesn't exist, so it creates it, it gets the attributes again, and begins a buffered write, so there are several write calls, that wraps up, it gets the attributes, now it's done, and then it releases the, uh, the file descriptor there. Uh, I'm sure many, many people in this room have very customized shells that show whether you know, you've committed to git, whether you've pushed master, uh, whether the directory is dirty or not, uh, when you run this and you have you know, your shell, you're, you're interacting with your shell, you actually get to see all of the read and write calls your, um, you know, your shell extensions make, which sometimes is, is pretty scary. Uh, so the, uh, the next step, step two, is uh, let's create kind of a, a janky in-memory file system. And uh, this is probably uh, horrifying any systems engineers in the room. But believe it or not, you can, uh, you can actually do something like this where you represent uh, every file in your Fuse file system 
as uh, an array of, of buffer objects, uh, which, um, believe it or not, uh, does work, and uh, you end up being able to do, to do arbitrary uh, transform operations on it. So this is, let's rename all of these file names to have an MD5 hash. Very common thing in a front-end workflow. You're going to ship up some files to uh, you know, an S3 bucket. You want them uh, cached at the edge uh, based on their content. So hey, it generated MD5 hash, put it in the file name, and you're good to go. Uh, tons of libraries in the build tool of your choice that do this. Uh, but this example um, is kind of interesting because it's taking these buffer objects that exist in memory as we've copied files in there. It's getting the hash and then renaming the uh, file and setting uh, that it, it, we've generated the fingerprint to it. So when we're actually copying files to the directory, uh, then using this, you know, maybe four or five lines of code, uh, you then rename them with their MD5 content hash, which is kind of cool. Uh, similarly, uh, with gzip, uh, another transform, and the nice thing about the gzip and fingerprint examples is they're both very buffer-friendly operations. So if you have a buffer, and we do, because our entire, uh, you know, persistence is just an in-memory uh, JavaScript array, uh, we just pass it to the standard glib gzip, gzip and uh, we've got a compressed file. We create that file, and uh, we're, we're good to go. Um, one, uh, one aside is there, and I think this is really when it gets to leveraging the existing Node.js ecosystem and NPM modules, is there are hundreds and hundreds of buffer and stream helper libraries. They make kind of writing these, uh, these extensions super straightforward. So one is called writable stream, which automatically resizes a buffer if you run out of space. So if in this file system we want to accept arbitrary, you know, files of different size that might exceed our default buffer size, uh, writable stream automatically resizes at a specified, uh, specified increment if we run out of space. So a lot of, re a lot of really nice things in leveraging existing th uh, stream and buffer libraries there. Um, performance profiling. Um, we, uh, you know, uh, as James Coyle said, uh, there's the great, there's, there's a lot of great literature about kind of benchmarking I.O. performance. Uh, one good one from James Coyle is on his Linux blog, and he says very wisely, it's tricky at best. And the reason that is, is that modern file systems are very, very smart. They cache as much as possible in memory using very sophisticated techniques that are far beyond the scope of this talk. Um, the easy route uh, that was suggested was, hey, let's use DD to create this, uh, this file a few times and then time it. Um, the good news is this file system is slightly, uh, slightly faster than a, uh, a floppy disk. Um, uh, <laughs> so, uh, welcome to 2015. Um, uh, the, the TLDR here, and you know why, why I'm up here talking about this, is I think it's a really fun dev tool, and I think the Node community is extremely created, and absolutely, absolutely on my wish list is for someone to create the world's first like cat file system. It's totally possible. Someone should do it. But, uh, using node bindings, using you know existing stream uh, stream libraries, existing buffer libraries, um, it becomes very straightforward to kind of roll your own for a variety of different purposes. And I think this case of wrapping existing APIs is particularly powerful as we move more files to services like AWS S3 and uh, you know the the other variations of that, and um, bringing that back to the local file system. To, you know, to use the shell scripts and commands you've, uh, you know, you've used for a very long time. And lastly, and I think this is also important, um, particularly for me as someone who does not come from a systems background, and that's, it's a fairly approachable way to learn more about file systems and what actually happens when you're doing I.O. on these mounted file systems because you get a lot of insights into just, you know, you know, just debugging what's going on with all of these Fuse, Fuse uh, API calls. Which is, uh, which is pretty powerful. Um, I wanted to point everybody to three, uh, three, great, uh, three great projects. Um, first of all, the kind of the real front end FS uh, by Peter Mueller uh, called Fusile, which does ES6 transformations in the file system. Super cool, super worth checking out. Um, a, lot of, a lot of interesting stuff there. 
Um, Max Ogden uh, also has one called Mount URL, which mounts a remote URL. Uh, and the author of the um, the author of uh, Node um, Fuse Bindings also has one, and I, I'm, I'm curious if this is actually why I created it in the first place, it actually amounts uh, BitTorrents. So um, a lot of really cool projects, a lot of creativity around this space that, um, that's, that's pretty interesting and pretty compelling. And um, I think between this and the existing documentation, uh, no one, regardless of your background, should be very intimidated to kind of roll your own or, or hack around with it. Um, Wanted to say thanks very much, and if you'll forgive the, uh, the shameless plug here, uh, there is an unofficial after party tomorrow at uh, New, Relic, um, New Relic Node headquarters. The, uh, the Node.js team will be around to talk about some really awesome stuff, and uh, you can go to the link to learn more or uh, npm install after party, which will give you uh, more details too. Uh, with that said, uh, thanks very much and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference.